temperature. All that gives you, you don't want to know all that because you're not that much into that. I know. Gravitational pressure is involved. You need all of this stuff to get gravitational pressure. Gravitational constant, the average mass of the nucleons. You need the mass of the electrons, of course. The effective ion radii for each of those nuclides, which you can determine by calculation. Uh, the area, the uh, ion sphere radius for all the ions in the plasma, and then all of that put into this equation, you can arrive at the uh, gravitational pressure. And then the properties that affect the nucleides are the gravitational pressure and the thermal pressure. You put those two things together and you get the magnetic pressure. It's the difference between the gravitational and the thermal pressure. You get the magnetic pressure. From the magnetic pressure, we relate the field strength. This is the magnetic field strength, the magnetic pressure times 8 pi, the square root of that, gives us the magnetic field strength. And the magnetic energy is derived from that magnetic pressure and from the volume of the uh, individual components. Okay. So we're looking at magnetic energy affecting each individual nucleus, okay? And that's how you get it, right there. All right? Simple volume equation. Four-thirds, uh, uh, you know, uh, R cubed, where R is the radius of the nucleus, and the multiply that times the magnetic pressure, you get the magnetic energy, okay? So there's the radius. It's very small, 10 to the minus 13 meters, the effective nuclei radius. So the magnetic energy per nucleide then is calculated to be from this equation, like that, in joules. That's converted to MeV. So it's about 5.3, 5, 5 and a third million electron volts for each individual particle. Now what do they say? If you have enough energy at each individual particle, will it affect the decay rate? You bet. It's going to affect the decay rate phenomenally. Now, in the end of these three days, or actually roughly less than three days, we're going to have a cooling off of that plasma, and that's de demonstrating this. It's not so bright and orange anymore. It's getting gray. So the Earth is solidifying and being formed. And here are some of the elements, the major elements in the Earth, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium. And these are the amounts, okay, uh, that we know. These are the total energies, these are the energies to remove those electrons. And why do I need that? Because I have to know what the charges are. That's all. I'm just telling you. Just showing you that because I need to know what the charges are. These are equations that allow you to evaluate the electrostatic effect. That's the charge that you need from those atoms. You put that in here, you can calculate the electrostatic energy. Uh, electrostatic effects also repulsive effects as well. That's these charges here, Z, I, Z, J. You need that. You need this constant, K. That's an ionic strength constant. You don't need to know all that unless you're really into it. That's the equation you need to do that. What are the results? All total energies, magnetic energy, the electrostatic energy, the energy of the interactions, and the thermal energy. Okay? Those are the energies. You add them up, these are the quantities, and you get a total balance of almost, not quite zero, 0.09 MeVs negative. In other words, if you had a total energy balance from all of those things, it should be ideally zero. Okay? Now remember, we don't have an ideal situation here. We have a dynamic plasma, and I'm treating it as if what? As if it were frozen. So that's one of the errors, but it's close to being balanced. Okay? That's what I want to show you. Those total energies are close to being balanced. The negative energies are absorbed, the positive energies are released. Okay? But that would amount to a plasma frequency of the right order of magnitude, having that amount of energy. See, these two go together. Okay. The magnetic energy is a dominant factor. That's the bottom line. The precise manner as to how that happens, you have to treat each nucleus independently. Okay? And I'm not going to go into the details of that because you really get lost. But you have to treat that independently, and it has been done in the paper. And the increase to the decay rate, the acceleration of the rates, uh, and uh, 
reducing the half-life is an enormous amount. And you can see how enormous it is right here. Now, this used to be a nice straight table. Before it got put into the PowerPoint, it got all crooked. <laughs> but you can't hardly read the red numbers anymore. And that's the one I really want you to see. Because these numbers are the numbers for uranium, 238, 235, thorium, 232, samarium, 147, rubidium, 87, potassium, 40. Well, see, the normal half-lives is this column right here. That's in billions of years, OK? That's the billions of years. These red numbers, which are kind of hard to see on that dark background, these are in minutes, two minutes, 13 minutes, 16 minutes, 1.6 minutes, two and a half minutes, 5.9 minutes. What does that say? These billions of years of half-life here have been converted to minutes of half-life when they were in the environment of the plasma. What happened? All the radioactive decay went on like that. It went on very fast within minutes. Most of all the decay that ever happened happened within minutes. So what, what are we measuring now? We're measuring some relationships based upon the present half-lives that have no bearing upon the initial conditions. That's what we're saying. The initial conditions were totally different from what they are now. So the half-lives were totally different. The rates of decay were totally different. They were extremely fast. OK? Uh, that's the bottom line to this. I mean, these are the results. I eliminated all the complications as much as possible of all the details of the calculation. Uh, I'm going to revise this paper and more critical revision of it. And uh, those of you who are really into this stuff would like a copy of that. I'm perfectly willing to give you a copy, eventually being able to publish it sooner or later once I get over all the hurdles. It's really hurdles when you deal with this because you can't buck City Hall, you know. If you try to publish it in the open literature, forget it. If they don't kill you on the day, they'll kill you in some other way. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to do. So we're going to probably have to just publish it in the creation creation uh, circles, and that's good enough to get the word out, right? All right, I want to deal with one more thing here. This is a question. I'm not going over it again, but you can relate this in this kind of uh, uh, equation. That's uh, an equation that's simply a straight line. So if you measure the decay energy, or, or determine it in any kind of way, and look at the uh, decay rate process there, OK? then that's simply an equation of a straight line. And you can fit that, fit that to a straight line. And you can fit all of those data to a straight line, actually. In fact, here's a uranium, all the isotopes, the thorium, samarium, rubidium, potassium, all of them. There's data in here which you don't need to know about. It's spin sensitive, but you don't need to know that. These are the equations that govern that. And this is a confidence coefficient to fit those equations with that degree of reliability. So you got pretty good confidence coefficients here, better than 90% for sure. And uh, that means we got pretty good fits for these data as statistics go, right? So a linear relationship correlating the energy with the decay rate is a very valid way of looking at this. Conclusion, accelerated radioactive decay rates are the consequences of the magnetic energy perturbations that occurred when? In the primordial plasma state. Rapid dissipation of energy. Where did all the energy go? Results as the radius of curvature expands, inducing temperature decreases. Now, that's a thing that Humphrey's related to. Now, that's all, that's all related back to the expansion of the universe. We're just particularizing it to the expansion of the Earth, OK? Now, I don't necessarily have to use this. There are other ways of doing this. I can use Laplace's cooling equations and, and get results, and I have done that. But this is one result that was already on the slide. There's a temperature at the initial time when it was a plasma. Here's the temperature, average temperature at the surface, about 300 degrees. 
Initial radius of curvature would have been about this much. Final radius of curvature would have been about this much. And the point is, it's an equation that is related, according to Humphreys, by this. That the temperature is inversely related to the square of the radius of curvature. Okay? Now, if we took that, which is called the proper time t, in proper time t, use this information with another equation, and that's a complicated equation, and it's Humphrey's derivation. The time is related to these radii of curvature, and you can see that when I use that, I get a number. Oh, did, I, did I miss it? Where am I? Yeah, here's a number. 14.7 hours time to cool off from how much? 10 billion degrees to 300 degrees. 14.7 hours. Well, listen, two and a half days of creation, another half a day to cooling off, and the plant life in Scripture says what? Third day? No problem. Everything's cool, right? In the vernacular. <laughs> okay, I'm introducing this because Brian asked me to do so. I did some work with the Lucas uh, Bergman model. The Lucas Bergman model is envisioning the particles, the electrons, and the protons as rings. Uh, we call them a torus. Here they are. This is the torus of the electron and the proton. You can uh, step it up into a helicon. The helicon simply has uh, domains within the torus, which allows different energy states of the torus rather than just one ring. Now, the idea here is, is that the electrons and the protons are not point particles, as we learn in basic uh, physics and basic chemistry, but they are actually particles that have dimension. Okay? And that's the idea, that they are particles with dimension. Uh, each torus has its own uh, uh, size for a proton and its own size for an electron. The proton is a much smaller torus than the electron. So, the electron's negative, the proton's positive. What happens if the proton sits itself inside the electron? Neutral. What do you have? A neutron, right. So you have a neutron. Now, if I go to, say, potassium-40, which is what I'm dealing with here, and I look at the different shells for these neutrons and protons, and there are ways of doing that, okay? It's called nuclear shell structure. You start with the biggest numbers first, and you go down. So. Then in one form of nuclear isotope 40, you get one proton, that one neutron rather, in this shell, four neutrons in that shell, and three protons in that shell. In another form, by computation, you get no particles in the first shell, five neutrons in the second shell, and three protons in the second shell. That gives it very different properties. In fact, the energetics are different, and the Half-lives are very different. The first form of potassium-40 has a calculated half-life of about 1.3 billion years. It's also the one that they quote experimentally, so it agrees. This new uh, form, potassium-2, is 3.18 weeks. That's another form of potassium-40 that's never been measured. Why? Because it would have all been destroyed when it was created. It decays much too fast. There's none of that that would have been left. You'd have to have a fresh isotope of potassium-40. Here's how potassium-40 decays. It decays to calcium-40 and a uh, beta. That's the 1.3 billion year half-life. Also to argon, there are two ways you can look at it as beta absorption or positron emission. Same thing, okay? 1.3 billion year half-life. There are much more of this happening, about 80% more of that than that, okay? The second form strictly goes to calcium, 1.65 weeks for a half-life. Very fast decay, see? We calculated that using the model, okay? Here's some other nuclei, just to show you that it works. Beryllium, potassium, thorium, all of these guys. These are the calculated numbers. 
okay? These are the reported numbers in the literature. They all agree almost perfectly. If you can't read these numbers here and these numbers here, if you want to look at them up close, you're welcome to do so. But I'm sorry that this is such a great slide. It was originally done that way, and all we did was you know, scan it into here. But these calculated numbers, using the Berkman Lucas model, agree perfectly well with the known numbers that are in the literature. What are we saying? We're saying you can use the Bergman Lucas model to do accurate nuclear calculations, and we have done it, and it works extremely well. Now, who wants to believe it? I don't care. I mean, the results are there, you know? If you want to use our equations and our program and calculate those numbers, uh, you'd have to go to Eric, he's my associate, he's the one that wrote the program and did it, but you could do it just as easily as we could. So bottom line, end of story. Have, have radioactive decay rates changed over time? Definitely. When did they change? At the time of their creation. They changed within matters of minutes. Extremely fast changes. What do they measure now in the present time frame of the Earth? Billions of, ha billions of years in the half lives That's what they measure. That's not the same condition as they were exposed to initially. And then the end of this was, does the Bergman-Lucas model have any validity, even though it's severely criticized? Yes, it does have validity. I was one of the major critics in the beginning. I talked with you know, Dave Bergman and Charles Lucas at length, and I told them I was a quantum mechanic uh, theoretician, which I am. I'm a quantum chemist, basically. I do electronic structure and bonding calculations. That's my field. I don't always do nuclear physics, but I do nuclear physics sometimes. And uh, I told him, I said, I don't believe it. He said, well, give us a chance. We'll set up a model. We'll do the calculations, and we'll let you know what happens. That's the results right here. They worked. I mean, they worked beautifully. <laughs> so we can't criticize it anymore. It's a valid model. In fact, if you look at some of their papers from Common Sense Science, you will see the properties of the protons and the electrons and the neutrons. neutrons. They're all what, detailed for you and they're excellent agreement with the accepted values, every single one of them. So we have validated the Berkman-Lucas model as applied to nuclear properties, and we think we have validated that there has been accelerated radioactive decay so that all the decay measurements that are being done now are worthless. You just as well quit doing them. They have no meaning whatever. And I'll stand on that. Thank you.